Okay, I guess we're ready to start here. Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another CKS webinar. I'm very excited and delighted to introduce Dr. Linda Sapan, who will be talking today about the Cambodian filmmaker, Ung Sita. Um, before we begin Dr. Stepan's presentation, I'd like to introduce everyone to her for those of you who are not familiar with her incredible and many varied activities over the years. So let me start from the beginning. Um, Linda was born in 1975 in Phnom Penh. Uh, she survived the Khmer Rouge years, and she fled Cambodia in 1982 with her mother and siblings and was resettled in Montreal, Canada. Where in her high school, I've read, uh, she was the only Asian Protestant and the feeling of being an outsider was very much part of her life at that time. It became a part of her work in the future. Um, she, after graduating from high school, ended up going to Paris and studying sociology at the Sorbonne, um, <laughs> partly because her mother wasn't very comfortable with the, the idea that Linda, who loved drawing since she was five years old, um, wasn't comfortable with that as a career path. So. <laughs> Linda um, agreed to go and study sociology, which in fact turned out to be a good thing because now she's an associate professor of sociology at Mount St. Vincent College in New York City. Um, so um, Linda went on after getting her uh, undergraduate and master's degree to get a PhD. Um, I believe from Paris Nanterre University um, and completed that process in 2007 with many trips to Cambodia to do the research which studied as I remember from the um, abstract of the dissertation um, the changing shapes and forms of the city of Phnom Penh as it adapted to its population. Um, very interesting sounding dissertation. Um, while in Cambodia doing research for her dissertation, she met the filmmaker, John Perosi, and started working with him on the film that I imagine many of us have, have seen probably more than once. I know I have. Don't think I've forgotten about Cambodia's vibrant rock and roll scene in the 1960s and early 70s. Um, Linda and John had a daughter um, who's now 13 years old um, and um, she currently lives in New York City. Um, in the meantime, uh, Linda continued her work as an artist. So I, I think it's a mistake to think Linda is just an academic, which she is, and she's a very good one with a long list of publications, um, but she's, maybe, I, I don't know if this is an uh, accurate portrayal, but in her heart, an artist <laughs> um, who's organized many exhibitions um, and, and has had her work exhibited uh, throughout Cambodia, Europe, um, um, and Asia, really, um, with some very important um, exhibits that have helped really stimulate the art scene in Cambodia. One comes to mind in 2005, there was an exhibit at the New Art Gallery, which was seen as sort of kicking off the modern art scene in Cambodia. Um, from that 2005 exhibit, there's been several subsequently. And I wanna mention, I, I taught at University of Massachusetts Lowell for 20 years. Um, and the first time I heard of Linda was in 2006, when an exhibit called 1975, um, was shown there in collaboration with Amy Lee Sanford, 
and Anita, I always don't know how to pronounce her middle name, Yu Ali. Um, very interesting. And their collaboration has continued through the years. Um, there was one exhibit in New York City called Interlace in 2016, which I read a review of, um, and it sounds quite amazing. Um, all three of them have done very interesting and innovative experimental work. Um, people may be familiar with Anita's Buddhist bug, where she went around Phnom Penh um, dressed as kind of in a saffron Buddhist colored long, I would describe it as kind of a caterpillar costume where her head is sticking out one end and she's, we she's Muslim wearing a scarf, Muslim scarf. And then Amy's work is also just as interesting um, with her, I believe it's called Broken Pot installation where um, she breaks a pot and then tries to piece it back together piece by piece very slowly and carefully as kind of performance art. Um, and of course, Linda's art, just, just like the others, others that I was just talking about is as interesting and innovative um, with Linda's long interest in, in um, needlepoint and sewing becoming part of her artwork. Um, something that her mother forced her to do as a, as a young girl, which she resisted then, but now just like her sociology degree has become an important part of her life. So mothers always do know best, don't they? Um, so we have the artist and we have the filmmaker. You know, I, I, I mentioned, don't, uh, don't think I've, we've, I, I've forgotten, um, but Linda's also been involved in several other film works. One with, um, um, I'm spacing his name right now, um, Neung, help me Linda. <laughs> are, are you referring to Nate uh, Hun or as associate producer for Nian Kavik? Uh, uh, Nian, Nian Kavik? Yeah, Nian Kavik, right. He's the one who did the white building. Um, so a very interesting filmmaker, Nian Kavik, um, young man. Uh, so you were involved with some of his work um, and other people as well. So I think that gives us kind of a general idea of the many and varied and interesting lives of Linda. Um, as academic, filmmaker, artist, and the different places that she's lived, Cambodia, Montreal, Paris, and Cambodia, of course, um, and New York City currently. So with that said, um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Linda Sapan, um, who will now present um, her work, which is featured in this book. I hope everyone can see this. Um, faded reels. I, this may not be showing through because I've got this green screen background. But if it's showing, is it is it showing, or is it all blurred out? Anyways, the book Faded Reels are published in um, 2022, I believe. Features the um, film work of of three filmmakers, including um, Ung Sita. And, um, and Linda will be talking about her now. Welcome, Linda. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you so much. Before I share my screen, um, this introduction is really relevant to me in the sense that the journey that I took brought me to Faded Reels, right? Um, let me just share the screen while we are at here. Uh, full screen. So, where is full screen? I'm sorry, give me a moment. Here, full screen. What happened is this, um, I, 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 I did want to be a, when I was younger, uh, an artist and a writer. And um, obviously uh, as a Cambodian refugee uh, immigrant mother, um, that was not sustainable. Um, uh, she said, make a career, and then you could come back later. As I work on this process, became an artist on this, I've been thinking a lot and reading a lot about, so my, my work is when studies and I started to be involved in the art scenes um, and then the music scenes and then the films. 
And one of the things that I found um, that is jarring and sad is that very few things were written about Cambodian cinema. And the few things that were written often are wrong and sadly are written by people who either, in my opinion, have not watched the films, have not seen those films, or have not access to those films. And it's really a big problem. So I've read a lot of books about Vietnamese cinema, Korean cinema, Japanese cinema, and there, there is a whole tool of language for people, uh, art films, uh, uh, film lovers, students, anyone who want to learn about it, a language how to talk about their films. Cambodian doesn't have that. And it, it broke my heart to say, why is that? And I just realized, because in order to do that, you have to have certain things. The knowledge of the language, right? Um, I speak French, English, and Khmer. The knowledge about cinema's language, how to understand films in a way that it's not just entertainment. And I realized that also access to the film and because of how these coming together, I said, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I'm going to toot my horn. There's no other person better to write this book than myself because I do love the cinema and I have access to them through Nate Hoon, who is a collector. So this webinar cannot, um, can pass all the things that faded reels, faded reels, if those who don't have it, it's in Khmer, it's um, language, you could buy it everywhere, um, you could go to DMC, it's available at the Cine Hub, you could buy it from there, and it's available on Amazon in English versions. Today, I just want to focus on uh, Ong Sita, um, previously known as Ong Kontuk. Um, why do I want to focus on her? Because it seems that in, even though few things are written about the Kamal uh, cinema, uh, the very few moments when there's a uh, film festival, a memory festival, they always show the three others. The throw three men here on the cover. You have the man in the glass is Thielem Kun, amazing, one of the best filmmakers we have before the Khmer Rouge. You have Yvon Ham, uh, striped shirts, and you have um, Lee Bun Yim in the blazer jackets. Those three men are the main dominant narrative as these are the filmmakers, and then women are invisible. And because a lot of time people think, well, there was no women filmmaker. So uh, my attempt at this presentations, and at least through the films and the books, is to give acknowledgement of um, uh, Ung Sita's work. And, and, and a lot of time also about the reality of Cambodian cinema. So people are written a lot about things. After the Khmer Rouge, I feel people repeat facts and informations without backing them up. And I'm guilty of that too. Like we even say like 80% or 90% of Cambodian artists were killed. It feels true, but could somebody sit down and maybe do some of the counting, right? So I, I, I couldn't do with all the art. I decided to work on the cinema. And you know, a lot of time people were saying, oh, there were 300 films were made before the Khmer Rouge from, nine, from you know, 1960 to 1975. Others say 340, others say 400 films, but not really having a sense. So with Nate Hoon and Hui Watana list, with backing up sources from ads, from interview, from poster, 446 films were recorded. I want you to sit down and think about this. From 1960 to 1975, in 15 years, in a country that is small as Cambodia, 446 films were made, right? Without no budget, without no states funding. This is all home production companies. And then the same thing, people say, oh, you know, how many films survived? So um, if you watch the film, a documentary film by David Chu, The Golden Slumber, it's such a harrowing film, a documentary film to show what had been lost. You know, if you're an artist and these filmmakers, artists that are survived, none of the work that to our knowledge I like to say it lost. I like to say the word lost because I hope that someday we find them. I don't want to say destroyed. But it's really harrowing when you made maybe in your lifetime 15 films and none of it survived. You made 40 films and none of it survived. So this filmmaker are really, really um, sense of legacy and the whole national country are lost. And David Chu in the Golden Summer did a fantastic job about it. 
I wanted to focus on the surviving films. So a lot of people said, you know, 10% of 333 films more or less that have survived. Um, so Faded Real, me and with uh, Nate Hoon and all this try to even partial, like even though it's like 10 minutes survive, we had counted around 58 films made that are still lasting. Some of them are available on YouTube. Others are in private collections of reels that people have found, right? Production company, companies, Kristen Will reported there were 60. Uh, we counted 73. Uh, and I think we're still counting uh, 73 production company. Again, of a small population of Cambodia, so much people were really into uh, films and filmmaking. When it comes to women, again, a lot of them said, oh, well, there were no women making film. This is more a male production companies and all these things. And I disagree. So through, again, through archivist thing and researching documentations, we have found here the list of all the early Cambodian cinema female director, Chan Nari. So Chan Nari, you know, um, she was um, uh, in Bird of Paradise, was with the body D, Marcel Camus. And uh, she made five films, right, before she passed on to her, uh, 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 sorry, not Chan Nari, Hem Nari, Hem Nari. She made three films and she passed on to her brother, Yvon Hem, right? And then you've had the same thing. Bung Sita, uh, her brother started the um, uh, production company and then he was um, uh, working in the mountains. And then her mother said to her, well, keep on the production um, company uh, in the family. And she made, uh, six women total. So you have uh, Disavet, sometimes people uh, forget, uh, always seen her as the movie star that she is, and, uh, and she was, and she still is, but she was also listed for all the, you know, um, um, uh, from, uh, films that she worked with uh, Hui Kang, uh, her former husband, uh, 18 films that they produced together, she was co-director, co right? Um, 18 film that means she and in my interview with her she did like she gave um, stage directions she gave script directions she she so wasn't just someone who it wasn't just simply a name tag because she was famous so women had a role in 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 productions not only as movie star Vijara Dani as the bottom here had actually made two films the third one was unreleased before um, it, uh, it was never released because she made it um, in 1974 and the Khmer Rouge uh, kind of took over um, the film was never released. So these are the things, I'm sorry, these are the things to show that Cambodian cinema are such a big unknown and women presence are such a big unknown and own Sita and own, um, is such been left out in the narrative and her films, some of the review that describe her as really melodramatic. And a lot of people think this is too much over the top. But a lot of time, I think you have to sit down and watch the film. And it's one of the things that's really hard when you're watching Cambodian films, early Cambodian cinema, is because they are so faded. When they're so faded, it's so hard to, to really understand the beauty, the, the beauty of the costume, the lighting, the staging, because it's just a specter, a remnant of something that is fading and disappearing because people who found them are cutting them together. And one of the reasons Unsita do not watch her own film now that is available on YouTube by other people uploading them is simply she said, it's, it's not the films that I have made. When I made those films, they were reels editing in the way that she wanted. Now people chip chopping, scene missing, a whole scenes are missing and all these things. Music, sound, it's not the original sound that she have had in mind and created. So these are really, I, I do understand anyone wanting to watch Cambodian pre-war film. It's quite challenging because of the deteriorate, deteriorations of the state of the reels. But despite that, if we could go further, and you could go further beyond the melodramatic and all these about Ong Sita, you will find that she of among all the film, and I watch all the film and I watch all even Sihanouk's films, and I'm gonna tell her she is unique because she really think about psychology and characters. Where other, right, you have certain filmmakers, they're all about it making money. Let's produce them. Some production company release like six films within a year. 
you could expect that storytelling is being resourced, stage costume being resourced. Um, Sita is not interested in that. And this is the thing I want to go over and hopefully we could go and analyze it better in her work. So her body of works, she started to make her first film was more a classical folk tales. And not, it was very popular in Cambodia to have these um, based on folk tale because it's really good to have story that people already know. If you do like the Twat Sister, Nien Kang Rei, right? Or you know, uh, people already know the story. Uh, so Van Hong and all these things, they come and they could follow. So she started with that classical folk tale. And then later on, she's just like, you know, I made this film for my mother, but now I want to make my own film with story that interests me, with um, character that interests me. And I think having a woman telling a story about women, her film is interesting because she's not about having two women picking, picking against each other. Like you stole my man, you took, it was never about that. It, although there is always a love triangle, it's the psychology of the, love triangle that she's interested in. Why do, why, at what point do people betray the value, their belief, their own sister, their own best friend? And that was, I think, was interesting about her. So unfortunately, three, um, two, um, the three of them, Prah Vesandar, Nekhen Jinek, and Santarun, we have not found um, the three films that have survived is Tabri Me Bang, Mui Man Alai, and Pelda Tronyum. Her reels is the one of all the collectors that I have interviewed and know. We don't know how her reels survived. She do not know. Her life story is an extraordinary one. If you have a chance, read it in the interview in Faded Reel. That woman is stellar. I mean, I had to interview her and even through the answer, you could see her sound, her strength and her willpower. And um, her life story should be made in a film. She was one of the last convoy in the French embassy, the tree truck that crossed the border. She had a newborn infant and she said to me, this is the last thing I thought it was to bring my will with me. Obviously to this day, we kind of regret, we all regret as a legacy, but we don't know how it surfaced back in VHS, in Long Beach and all these things. Um, we, we kind of, and among the collector, think someone did found it, but we, I have not been able to trace um, uh, the backstory of that. So the first film, like Tavri Mubon. So I'm gonna give you a quick of a summary of this, right? So Tavri, so the, the main story is Tavri that is played by some Van Sudani. Um, she's in love, she and her love interest is Konsum Un, Suchit, and Suchit is a performer, right? He's a singer on television, all these things. Tavri has a younger sister named Sunny, and Sunny is this carefree, very trendy girl who is like watching TV, but doesn't really have an understanding between what's reality and what is media, what is on televisions. She, she think that, you know, Bridget Bardo is the ultimate of cool and that um, so Chiat, when he's performing, he is performing only with, for her. So she fall in love with this, uh, with Sochit without even meeting him. And Sochit has a best friend named Sorin and Sorin fall in love with Tavari, right? So the whole story to me, what is interesting, is not about Tavari and Sochit, the love, but about, the sister and the best friend, the side character. So basically the side character is this, they are falling in love with people who are not loving them in return, has never shown, never said any, so it's unrequited love. What is interesting is how Ung Sita filmed them. She, you know, back then she wrote the whole script, she edited it, she filmed it. So it's really what we call a film author. And Unsita being really much into, think about this, she was 18 years old when she filmed, right? and she was studying, and filming was in 16 millimeters. So she, she, it takes a long time because she only shoots in the weekend, and at night she would be in her room, dark room, and trying to cut, back then they cut and tape together to make this film. And she's someone who really carefully draft the dialogues. By the time that Ong Sita was making film, sound was already available in Cambodia before, sound was not available. So she really crafted dialogues to be at most natural, to be reflecting real people, rather imaginary ones. And 
So Sunny, her, the sister who falls in love with her brother-in-law, struggle with that. Struggle on how to deal with this. How do you, it's almost a Freudian question. What do you do when you fall in love with your brother-in-law? Where Sorin fall in love with his best friend's wife, right? What do you do? And it's really interesting because movies all about what? Movies about make-believe, but also about human flaws and that we could connect. And I think that's what makes Unsita such a great filmmaker is that she finds humanity flaws and but depicted on films and shows how the decisions and the way she filmed both the character and storytelling is very different. You could see that Sonny, because it's her sister, she did not betray her sister immediately. She did not take any, she pretended to be sick. She, so she wouldn't attend the wedding. Then she tried to withdraw herself from the scenario until something happened. The sister, right? Tavari thought that she had leprosis, and then decided to break up with um, Sochiat, then Sunny comes in. So Sunny in the end, the or mid of the film, gets her brother-in-law. But throughout the rest of the movie, when Sunny gets the man she always wanted, right? Onsita does not show that she was happy. Show her, as you can see in the picture, right? In these very hats and trendy, she was carefree, young, right? And then after she got her, the man that she wants, the man of her dream, her sister, husband, Unsita showed her being very depressive, always disheveled, always lying down in bed, always in nightgown. So showing that impact that even though she got what she wants, she does have remorse. And that's not truly what. Whereas when the way she described, she filmed Sorin, Sorin is the best friend. At soon as he could, Sorin tried to steal Tavri away, right? And the betrayal is, and I think that's very smart of her because a friend is not like a sister or brother. And this is where I find Unsita very powerful to compare to other who are plot focused. Unsita is character driven, right? To give background to the motives. Right. Obviously, it's a love story, unrecorded love. But right, the question is this: What would these two characters that are obsessed by people they fall in love, will they follow through to their obsessions or not? And I think she did a really good job in trying to show that it's complicated answer, um, and then developing that throughout the whole films. Um, the ending went a bit quick, and I think she ran either out of time or budget. It quickly wrapped up um, and um, uh, Sunny started to wake up from her um, depression mindset and realized that that was wrong to try to do what she did. And she went to apologize. And um, Sorin started to reveal the scheme, the lie that um, Tavri did not have the process. And then um, he, she did not have an affair with him. And then so she forgives. So it was a bit wrapped up at the end, but I think it's come to budgeting. But throughout this movie, I really thought the character development was interesting. And then the second film, well, the second, the second film that is still alive, uh, available, is 10,000 Regret um, Women Alive. And here again, right, um, the plot over dramatics, again, still, you know, two couple falling, in, uh, one couple falling in love. Uh, um, the man wants to give um, a beautiful house, a beautiful life, and decided to go to war to get some money and come back and find out that, you know, the woman here is with another man. So the story seems to be over the top. But Women Align, to my knowledge, is the really first movie that talk about war trauma. So you have here, Kong Sun Kong Sun is play the role of, um, um, uh, Kosal. And uh, so Kosal, um, at the beginning of the film, he's carefree, he's a taxi driver, he's always in a um, singing song, um, you know, uh, outdoor and um, laughing all the time. After the war, the way she filmed him and the way Kumsun, I think Kumsun play a lot of film, but I think here he really um, his acting really shine through and without no dialogue. It's just simply showing that this man have seen a lot and came back 
and came back a changed man. War changed people and not in the best possible way. So the way he talked is a bit more abrasive. She films Kusal after the war, always indoor, always dark, always inside, right? As if he struggled to get out, to connect to people and always in a dark lighting. And obviously, this is not accidental. Filmmaker, you could say sometimes, you know, oh, this is by chance, chance, coincidence. To me, it's not coincidence because you could see a clear cut between before and after the return. So I wanna show you a small clip because um, um, I could describe to you, but I think it's more powerful that you see this section of yourself. So this is a scene. Um, So this is the scene where, right, Kosar come back from war, but this is a couple years later. He was um, he left Navi, like um, um, um with his father who's ill. But in the process, when um, in his absence, uh, Navi uh, had to bury um, her father, well, the father of her lover, and then he's alone, try to survive. And then she meet this really kind man named Tildes, who decide to invite her to take care of her. And she lives in the wealthy homes of this wealthy family. So Kusal comes home and find this, right? So let's watch this together. I'm sorry. So what this scene says, uh, what this scene says a lot is this. For me, there was no dialogue. There's no voiceover. Movies back then, filmmaker, director have a tendency to add a voiceover, to add, to give an explanation to the audience, to tell what is this going on. Like here is Gustav coming back from war, his father is dead, his girl is gone, right? We didn't have any of that. And I think this is where Onsita trusts her audience and trusts her own skills set at editing to say that people will understand. The Cambodian audience have seen enough film to be able to interpret these scenes as a sad one. And this is very unique because in the other films, there was always, always an explanations or over explanations. Um, in the same way, Onsita, it was one of those filmmakers who was just like, I, I, I want to make a serious film. So I didn't hire any comedians. And people thought she was crazy because that's how, that's how you get people to come see your me movie. You get a comedian and then you make a, you know, plastic scenes and then people would laugh about it because comedians were the stars. And she just felt like, comedians tend to make things more you know, uh, clownish. And she wanted, if she wanted to make people laugh, she'd rather create a scene that is situational comedy rather than just slapstick comedy. And obviously this film is not about that. 
And it's the only film to my knowledge that deal with PTSD and war. You have um, uh, uh, Bopan Ka with uh, Elizabeth and it's a Chinese uh, production, co-productions. And the war is a scene. So this uh, um, um, Elizabeth plays a um, doctor at the front line. She meets a, um, uh, a Chinese uh, uh, journalist. They fall in love. She's part of the guerrilla. They go fight and it's very violent, very fighting but doesn't deal with the idea that war has some kind of effect on human beings. The only other reference I could think that relate to this is maybe um, Pu King Kong, right? With the Tia Lung Kung, who shows explosions and skulls as if it seems um, um, a reference to the war that is happening in the 1970s that time. But still, this is a symbolic reference where uh, Osita just showed to you visually what it looks like, right? And you could see from him squinting the eyes, his slow pacing, right? Um, in the early part of the movie, he's moving fast, he's um, jumping all the time, full of energy. He just slowing down a lot more. And throughout the rest of the film, you show him that, show him how this is not the same Kosal that we first meet. And again, that is what I think her strength is building characters. It build, these characters and backstory build up their um, motivations. Why, why did he, he come back, right? And now he wants to come back to him and he doesn't want her, right? Because the reason he doesn't want her, he knows he's not the same. And he has um, on the ability to provide the happiness that she deserves. When you don't think about that, you should think about the surface. Then you're just saying, oh, this is over the top. Why would he reject her? And she's not married to the other man. It's not the end of the world. But it's a psychology that she gives the motivation behind his rejections of um, the love um, uh, of his life that is Navi. And am I, am I, am I good? I still have uh, one more film, so I'm going to go over. Um, uh, this is um, Père de Trignum. Père de Trignum is really a, um, a love letter. I think uh, a love letter of uh, Un Sita for the film industry. Um, Sita really have an understanding that uh, the film industry has power on the people. The silver screen, the movie stars have certain, uh, you know, aura that people, the regular Joe and Jane falls in love with. And, and that's why she made this film. The first film, right, this is, um, uh, you see uh, Kung Su Um's, uh, he, he, the, the opening film, he goes and he ran and cross into a movie scenes. So the uh, people are shooting films and all these things. And then he starts to daydream. And, and this is the power of the cinema. And she really makes the whole film about the reflections, the role of the movie stars, and the, 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 the amazing things to be famous and the downfall of being, it's almost a star is born, the modern versions, right? Vijara uh, uh, Dani is discovered by a director that's played by Not Nam, and then he, she becomes famous and uh, her lover is behind and he follow hers and Vichets um, uh, uh, and Vichets become a star too, um, right? The, and then Molida is the daughter of the director he falls in love and um, a, a little bit more, again, complicated love story and drama. But what is interesting is how Bonsita is trying to do referencing, a meta reference about the cinema. So if I'm gonna go back, if you remember Tavari, Mirbon, Sonny and Tavari are sisters. And they have a, uh, an argument where Tavari said to her sister say, um, do you know that this is a movie in real life is different and already, Unsita is having an understanding that some people may not always understand the difference between movies and realities. And there are uh, interviews I read in a magazine that says like sometimes the actor had to explain to people that, you know, that Konsum Un is not really with Vijaradani, right? This is just on screen love. And then, um, so some pe people have a misunderstanding what is depicting reality from what's, uh, happening in screens, especially in her film, because her film are not folktale. They're not mythical legend. They're not about like an ogress and a king from a faraway kingdom. This is modern life. And therefore, sometimes the audience are not used to this 
I'm going to just make a pause in my own personal life when I was doing an art piece called Lightness with Sophia Pick. Um, we, we wanted to depict uh, Cambodian people differently than, you know, sad and war victim. We wanted to show them being light and uh, suspended in happiness. So I built a trampoline. I make people jump on the trampoline. And then I photoshopped it and I glued the pictures on a fabric that looks like cloud. And we managed to have monks to jump on it. And when I went to the Photoshop, uh, the photo screening printing place, the people say, tell me where the flying monks live. And this back in 2005. And I said like, there's no flying monks. And people was like, why are you being so selfish? Like there is obviously a flying monk. And I explained to them about trampoline and all these things. So people, sometimes Cambodia are superstitious and believe in this what they see because understanding Photoshop and studies is something that not always having a language and understanding of this savviness. So um, a time to cry is really about that. Her referencing the professional life, the personal life, the narrative of moving to the movie stars. But to me in these scenes, this footage of Kusum's um, um, daydreaming as he's riding his bicycle, it's, it's first, it's a scene he's gonna, he's daydreaming and then he didn't look and he ran into uh, uh, Vijaradani. It's like, you know, boy meets girl. So it's a, a romance story. But you could think like um, uh, um, also about the idea of her understanding of the power daydreaming, the power of how he just saw a scene that being shot and by movie star and how that movie star makes you also do daydream. But also these scenes, as you saw on the slides, how much it's faded and how much how many of these movie stars have disappeared? And how much of our legacy has disappeared? So there's so many reading to understand that these legacies of the early Cambodian cinema, the stars have been dimmed, their life have been killed. The few reels that we have of them are also fading. And that as much as you want to daydream about them, when I watch these scenes, it makes me realize how much it's faded from the memory. When I went to present last summer in Cambodia, so many younger, when I say, when I say, oh, and some Kung Sun Un, and I realized many people say, like, who? And I'm like, oh, you don't know Kung Sun Un. They are fading also from the memory. And there is something about Un Sita refusing to watch this because it's not the film that she made. And in many ways she's right, this is not the film that she made. But in other ways, I feel grateful that even it's a specter of an image, I'm still grateful that we still have that specter of an image um, um, of, um, of um, the cinemas of Pedatronium. Um, Cinema was a big deal in Cambodia um, to the point that even songwriter actually wrote about it. So I'm gonna just play a clip by this one by Sinsisamut. So the whole song is about, you know, he's going on a date. Where should we go? What kind of thing we're going to watch and all these things. And the fact that, you know, uh, movies and singers start to reference that, like this Peta reference is really important. There are other films that, there are other films from our research that they mentioned there's a director, there's a movie, uh, you know, Back Days Now, it's about, um, you know, um, uh, the industry, uh, the media industry and human trafficking. Uh, but here in Time to Cry is truly about the industry itself, the, the uh, what it looks like to be acting, what it's like to uh, being famous. Um, again, diving deeper than just mentioning it, oh, this person wants to be a famous person and then working in the industry, this is tackling the film industry itself. And it truly is a, a, a legacy to uh, almost giving us a snippet on how things are done um, uh, when they were filming and shooting back then. Um, so, oops, sorry. 
So in terms of her legacy, um, um, I think, I think in terms of visual legacy, I want to talk, not just the film and the narrative, is that because she filmed in contemporary Cambodia, um, we have a lot of image of how people lived, what kind of houses, what kind of fashions, what kind of car they drove. And, uh, uh, you know, back then what filmmaker was, because it's a family affair, uh, obviously because a film costs a lot of money, you could assume that only the wealthy people, so it's a very bourgeois family affair. So a lot of time what they do is like they, um, you know, um, film in the home, in the villa, in France, in uncle and houses, they take each other cars and all these things. But those who um, built, um, you know, um, stages for, uh, if you're building folktales and you have to build, a, um, you know, a thrones and a kingdom and all these things, costume. But if you're doing modern setting, you're basically just filming what is happening. And because of that, just like Sihanouk's film are such a legacy of visuals, of heritage, of like what it looks like, Ong Sita is also a um, visual legacy because um, she she didn't have an agenda in terms of, okay, I'm going to film this because it has a political agenda. She's filmed this because the fashion was trendy. Um, and she actually said it. She was so happy because she kept all the clothing of all the movie stars and she wore them herself. Um, um, so it, there was obviously an, a consciousness of making the movie uh, stars a character to feel realistic and fashionable per her characters, right? So in that way, you know, you think about, don't think of a gun, you've seen about all the um, other um, documentary films. We go back to those three films that she made, the, all the snippets, car, convertible, um, a background and all these things, this urban setting. Uh, thanks to her, we have a, quite a legacy of visual, what it looks like Cambodia in the 70s, basically. Phnom Penh, I should say, not all Cambodia, right? So um, in that sense, I'm grateful for her three films to be still alive. In terms of her contributions to the film, I, I really think that if, uh, I mean, I hate when we say this, but I do want to say this. If we think we didn't have to come out, which, right? Uh, um, Unsi Ta will become the next uh, film that she will maybe will be a psychological thriller because all her stories are about plot twists. The way she talks about her films are not romance she's not never used she talks about you know i want to surprise my audience i want to keep them on their toes i want and i just go like this is, seems to be someone who's interested in psychological drama and psychological thriller then about you know love scenes and making them meet come and all this so i believe that if she could continue to make films she would be probably really good in psychological dramas and thrillers um and unfortunately when she arrived in france it was a struggle and um, film was her last things to be in her mind. I mean, she did come back being aware that was much later on her films and she saw some snippets. She just felt um, um, she lost much of her desire to want to rebuild this. But recently she went back to Cambodia and gave uh, the authorizations of the surviving uh, films to um, Bopana, right? Unfortunately, not the reels, but just the digital or VHS that is found in the markets. Um, so she's still quite alive, although many people thought she was not, and not, although a few people made the effort to research her, um, her contribution to me, in my opinions, is quite um, um, powerful because it is more than just um, love story and triangle and this, it is really much um, uh, someone who developed her story um, and characters and bring us a really um, wonderful uh, idea of what to be a woman filmmaker and telling story from a woman perspective. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much, Linda. That was really interesting, of course. Um, a lot of questions that I have personally, um, some things to talk about. And I see we do have several questions on the chat that we'll get to after. But I thought we would spend a few minutes just talking. Yes. Um, well, I, I jotted down um, a few topics, perhaps we could go over. Um, the first one is basically trying to contextualize um, filmmaking and 
um, Ung Sita's work in particular within the larger context of the Sihanouk era and all of the cultural production that was going on at that time. You know, we know it was an explosion of Cambodian cultural production in all areas of art and, and dance, yeah. music. Of course, you know from the, the film, don't think we've forgotten. Um, in architecture with the Nukumar architecture, in, in, in literature, um, hundreds of novels. I mean, I think the numbers are similar to the films um, mm -hmm. in terms of the numbers of novels that were produced during that 15 year period. I mean, 50, you know, 400 novels or films um, over a 15 year period, I just crunched the numbers, comes out to a little more than two a month. So it's quite an extraordinary output of work um, in a short amount of time. So I'm wondering if you could just comment on, um, was Ung Sita um, caught up in that energy, that creative energy that was going on at that time and, and feeling that she wanted to be part of that? I think so. I mean, you know, I think her and family are quite a bit different than others. I think they were wealthy, but they were not into it to make money. And I'm going to say this, the reason why, because she's not, she was not making six films a year. She was making one film every two or three years. Um, and, um, a lot of the wealthy family who went into this business do want to produce enough to be paying off the films, right? Uh, in her case, there was a, a, an artistic desire to make something meaningful, a story. Mm -hmm. She was really into telling story. And the thing, one of the, she come from an unusual family. Her father resigned from being a civil servant and decided to become an interpreter to travel the province and he will come back and tell lots of story. And these are how she was interested in storytelling uh, as a value. So filmmaking is really long process in Cambodia. 16 miller, you film them, right? You film them, and then you cut and you cut down and all these things. You send it to France to get it uh, printed. Back then, only three films. If you're lucky, you have three reels that are like the same film, three reels, one for Phnom Penh theater, and they share it. All this movie theater, they take turns. I get Monday at two o'clock. You get Monday at four o'clock, and they, and be, because the film are being Check so much, the reels are very damaged, right? The second reels go to the props, so they put the problem. The third reels, usually those who get an original screening, like T. Limpen, is very successful originally, he will print a, three film, a third reel. So reels are so expensive to print because if you film and let's say you make a mistake, you have to send it to the lab to print it in France and ship it back. It's a long process, it's not today digital. So it's even more impressive when you say more than two films a, a month because you know that they have to go ship back mm -hmm. and forth. Right. So yes, mm -hmm. I think the, the 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 fever was like film Cambodian entertainment back then. If you're educated, you go to see what Lacan and all these things, but you know, for the main regular people who may not be able to um, have time to go, film is the easiest way, right? You don't need to. And all the one that does Chinese, Indian, uh, Europeans, uh, they could go sit down. It's really cheap. Yeah. And then when Cambodian film came, it's even better because you could have like someone from Badabon, uh, uh, farmer who just goes sit down for two, uh, you know, for real whatever could watch the film over and over again uh, and because of that Cambodian film was such a success uh, even him said uh, his film paid off a movie theater he bought a movie theater because of one of his film uh, Savan Hong uh, um, so there is a um, some went to it for money some other went to it because they are as a medium right uh, as a form to express themselves I don't, I, I, again, I don't think Ung Sita's family pressured her to make money, but more that because the brother started this, um, why not continue because the money has already been paid for all the camera and things like that. Mm, thank you. A, a little follow-up question to that. Um, to what extent do you think um, Prince Sinok at that time, head of state, um, contributed to the high production of filmmaking because you know he's considered the first filmmaker Cambodian filmmaker of that time um, at least I've read that um, that 
that, that is a title that he's very willingly accepted. Um, and well, also- yeah. I think he was making documentary films and they were sh shown in the private of the palace and all these things. But I think Lee Darabut Ingridman in uh, Cultural Independence show uh, stated that the first feature film, so it can be anything, but the fiction was actually uh, not Sihanouk, but uh, from some other, I think, who uh, made the first film, uh, feature films. So, um, and, and was shown in pop. A lot of Sihanouk film first were shown private and then international and then locally. Um, and Sihanouk uh, also created a production called Kemba. Uh, mm -hmm. has funding from, I guess, the government that the other filmmaker didn't necessarily have, right? The other film, mm -hmm. uh, production company, the other 73, was more out of pocket of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So they tried to levy, so Sianik did support the art, the film by saying 40% uh, of each tickets are tax levied um, um, from any films and Cambodian film productions uh, received 20% back. In that way, it does was an incentive that way to receive the money. Yeah, I was going to mention that. I just want to re repeat that so everyone can hear that again. So the foreign films from Thailand, China, et cetera, India, were taxed at a rate of 40% on the ticket, um, which increased the price of the tickets for those films. And the government reduced that tax to 20% for Cambodian-made films. So reducing the price of those tickets and incentivizing um, going to see a, a Cambodian film over a Thai or Chinese or Indian film, which as you said, had the kinds of supernatural characters and legendary historical settings that people liked. Um, but the Cambodian filmmakers um, received that support. Um, do you see that support um, within the context of um, you know, Sihanouk's attempt to create a national and cultural, you know, combine national and cultural identity at that time, and, um, you know, uh, support and sponsor, for example, um, you know, the Cambodian folk dances that came out of the Royal University of uh, Fine Arts, RUFA. Um, you know, some of the things that we, you know, the invent, I guess we would call what Eric Hobsbawm would call the invented traditions, you know, the, the, the new cultural production that was meant to seem like it was there for a long time, but was actually recently created. So for example, uh, out, of the, out of Royal University of Fine Arts, um, the coconut shell dance was choreographed, you know, in that time in the 60s. And we all know the coconut shell dance as being, um, you know, synonymous almost with Cambodian New Year and other cultural events where there would be a folk dance performed along with the Apsara or Chunpo dance. So my point here is, is that um, there was this strong effort to produce um, art, you know, work, cultural work, uh, artistic work that reflected Cambodians' newly defined cultural identity as an independent sovereign state, modern, modern sovereign state after independence from the French. And I'm asked, my question here is, to what extent do you see filmmaking feeding into that process of um, creating this new cultural identity as a modern state? It, it, it seems like it would, given that film is seen as um, very avant-garde and very modern and future, you know, um, cutting edge kind of art form. I, I think, um... I've seen it in all Cinex film, that idea of building a national identity and all that stuff. I have not seen anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, you know, Thielung Kun, Thielung Kun made films that in an allegorical way was mm -hmm. critical of the, the uh, this modernization too. So um, they, uh, no, no, they tried to organize film festival, for example. And a lot of some of the filmmakers they don't want to submit their film to this film festival because uh, it's competing against Sianuk. Mm -hmm. I uh, his film won the first international competition, or the first national competition. Exactly. So there's 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 um, his political agenda and his own personal desire to be a filmmaker and artist that is competing with other filmmakers that do not feel comfortable. 
mm -hmm. against him so who rather not submit at all mm -hmm. and in the end he wins um so some people rather avoid this political conflict and not at all present and touch this topic yeah Great. The, the surviving film that I've seen, I have not seen that that idea to try to build a national identity. Mm. Okay, moving on uh, to another topic then, uh, going back to Ung Sita's life story. Now, you've touched on a, a lot of the interesting points about uh, her family was nonconformist. Um, I read uh, maybe in your book that she was a cinephile. She loved to watch movies herself. Um, and she encouraged her daughter to um, continue, as you said in your talk, um, her brother started a film company when he was in the military and based in Phnom Penh. But when he, had to, when he was relocated to the mountain areas and was no, no longer able to continue that business, um, Sita's mother encouraged her to take it over from her brother. Um, and then, as you mentioned, her father resigned from his position in the I think it was the Justice Ministry of Justice um, to become an interpreter in the countryside. And you come back home and tell his seven children, um, Sita and her six siblings, all about the different people that he'd met and the different events that he had seen, which I imagine must have fueled her imagination um, and sparked her imagination. Um, again, encouraging her to do um, what I imagine was a fairly unusual um, not even a, you know, a career path or, or, or life journey. Um, she she for still had to finish her studies. Yeah. She still had uh -huh. to, she, this was like a family business, but priority was still uh, her study. This was something mm -hmm. she would do in the evening, in the, uh, right? Uh, she would shoot films only on holidays, only on the weekend. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons it's a kind of slower process for her than compared to others. But, uh, um, Yes, I think from the way she talks about herself, she is a very outspoken woman. She is very mm. strong. She has a very strong opinions how she wants things to be done. Mm. And and then she says, like for example, when I asked her, did you how were you trained in film? She said, like I went to the best. I went to the movies, and mm -hmm. you know her favorite film was Gone with the Wind and Seven Samurai. And she's like, I was like the Seven Samurai. It's unexpectedly, right? I never thought this, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. come but she said, I watch over and over and over again. And that's how I learned to make films and, and tell yeah. stories. Um, um, yes, I think, um, you know, I think it's interesting in her journey um, to have a support from her parents, right? For mm -hmm. her mother to do this. Um, th the same way that, you know, she's the one who discovered Vijaradani, uh, the actress. Mm -hmm. And in somehow I wonder by the influence of the contact with Vijaradani, at the end, make them too. So mm -hmm. the idea that women can do this mm -hmm. uh, becomes also a director and be mm -hmm. behind the camera and tell the story. Um, yeah, I, I wish, uh, you know, um, I, uh, I know that she was heartbroken and it was hard for her to talk about it, but I always wonder if, um, you know, if she would have continued to make films, uh, how would it mm -hmm. be? Um, yeah, you know, um, I when I was reading your synopsis of her films, the first person that came to mind for me in terms of filmmaking was Alfred Hitchcock, you know, in terms of a psychological thriller. Um, and I, and I, instead of Gone with the Wind, I thought, you know, it would have been an, a, an Alfred Hitchcock film that had inspired her um, as a as a I'm young not, film. I, now I have to, now that you mentioned it, I need to check if there were any Hitchcock films shown in the movie theater. So it's uh, also what is available, right? So the embassy, so how do you could get some films, like, um, you know, some of the theater shows them and an um, embassy shows them and all these things. So it's uh, the most popular ones comes to reach to uh, Cambodia, but mm. not always, right? So I don't know if Hitchcock was, um, um, uh -huh, available then. Well, it seems to me that she was Cambodia's Alfred Hitchcock in a lot of ways. Um, now, because um, I, I was basically trying to trace this nonconformist, very progressive, independent thinking person, artist, um, you know, seeing the support from her family, the fact that, as you mentioned, 
Um, she didn't follow convention. She didn't use supernatural characters or historical storylines. You know, she went, as you said, you know, in, into character driven movies, um, delving into the psych their psychology. Um, and in doing so, and not using comedic characters like most of the other pe people did, because it took away from the realism of of her films and probably even the seriousness of the films to have these comedic characters coming in. Um, so she was this very, it seems to me, very independent, yes. strong-willed um, person with a strong artistic vision that she pursued. Yes. Um, did you get that sense from her? I mean, we haven't mentioned that you did an interview with her when you went to do your research that was very rare and you included a transcript of the research in your book Faded Reels. What was it like speaking with her? Did you get that sense of, you know, this kind of, um, you know, very independent um, minded woman who, who had her own ideas that she was driven to pursue? So, so talking on her phone, I would not have guessed she's 80 years old. Uh, the voice, her energy, she's like, I, I feel like, the, and that's why I chose picture of her still very young, that she shared with me these pictures. Mm -hmm. And because in her voice, in her energy, she's still very much uh, the uh, uh, the young Ong mm -hmm. So the reason, I, um, so she asked me, uh, She uh, so she's known, uh, all her films is credited as Ong Kantuk. And in the process going to France, mm -hmm. uh, she became Sita and she wanted to keep um, Sita Rama, which is, reference to Ramayana, her husband, French husband, family name is Rama. So she became Sita Rama. And what she asked me to connect both her past and present to have Ong Sita, um, uh, although, you know, um, she's known as Ong Konto before. Um, I I'm, I have to say, it's, 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 it's um, if she had means in France to make films, I, I think she would have been able. But obviously when you are arriving with just your pants and your shirts, you are struggling to make ends meet, but um, uh, she has not changed in a bit in the way, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I try to ask her questions, like what it's like to be surrounded by male filmmaker and you are the mm -hmm. woman, I just like, I don't understand your question. I just made my own thing. It doesn't matter about my gender. And she's like, you know, you're right. <laughs> but it's just mm -hmm. the way that for her, it, 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 I guess she didn't mind or she didn't care what people think. Yeah, and which, I think that was, was unusual for a woman yeah. at, at that time. Um, and I think because the money wasn't pressured in the same way. Mm -hmm. Look, if you have a chance to look at the film and you could go to the uh, link that I have um, uh, for those um, CKS could share the PowerPoint. Nate Hun has this on the, uh, the films um, and all the cars in the house are her family cars and family house I mean obviously they can mm -hmm. afford it <laughs> um she's not the wealthiest family in Cambodia um but um the parents was not uh, pressuring her to um you know as long as it's not going down it's not pressuring her to make money the same way than others are more pressured because they have to be paying off um um whatever they the actors and all that and, and more right mm -hmm. she was just having this and uh, since the, they have the gears since they have this why not make it um it's you know uh if she only make one film i would say oh it's a hobby it's a rich mm -hmm. woman's hobby but she obviously is not she's a bit more than that because she actually mm -hmm. makes six films uh, mm -hmm. from the moments right there's this mm -hmm. community and as you say she did it all she wrote the script she did the directing she did the filmmaking she did the production and the editing um, hours of work and time consuming, given that you have to send your film to France to be yeah. Um, printed. Yeah. printed. Yeah. Um, the last topic I wanted to touch on before we move on to the questions um, is what you see as the future of, of filmmaking in Cambodia now. Um, we mentioned Niam Kovet, um, who, whose film, um, The um, White Building, um, chronicled the destruction of the iconic white building um, in Phnom Penh and um, some of the interesting things that came out of that for him. And he's certainly on his way um, and, and, and doing very well as a young filmmaker, Cambodian filmmaker. Um, do you have a, a lot of um, optimism about the future of filmmaking in Cambodia? 
And yeah, art so, is so involved in the whole art scene. Yes, so there are Cambodian diaspora, Cambodian American, Cambodian French are making films and making, um, and they're doing quite well too. But Cambodian locals, uh, I'm excited. Uh, I'm mm. excited. The only thing that is challenging, film costs a lot of money. As mm. a painter, as a writer, you have mm. your canvas, you have your you know pencil or laptop, and you could have your imagination and make it happen. Film, you require actor, costume, makeup, mm. lighting, editing, and it costs money. And mm. and and I think <clears throat> think anti archive have found a solutions in fundraising to collaborate with all this, you know, from mm -hmm. uh, Korea, France, all these different organizations having contact to that. Uh, otherwise it's not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. If you make a film in Cambodia, who's going to watch it? In Cambodia, the market is very, very limited. So you need mm -hmm. to, be, in order to pay back, you need to reach out beyond Cambodian borders. Mm -hmm. And then you need to tell stories that are compelling enough for other people, whether they're Thai, Singaporean, Canadian, or American who want to see it, right? Mm. So anti kai seems to understand how to bring that to the global audience beyond Cambodian border, but how to do that via the others, right? To get the funding to, so it's all about the funding. I think the young filmmaker, the talents are there, they're ready, but how do you get fun? So a lot of films are made now are short films because it's cheaper. Right, to make a film that is 10 minutes, 17 minutes, or 20 minutes, it's much more affordable than a feature films um, because it costs, again, a lot of money to do this. So um, once we find a solutions way, it's just like if you could do a way the same way that um, back then where we leave via tax and receive, if there's a way incentive that from government sponsored events that can have a pool of money to give, right, or to fund, uh, it, it would be helpful. But at this mm. point, uh, it's not, uh, there's no subsidy in any way. So artists mm. and filmmakers are on their own. Uh, mm. So that's a struggle. Great point. Well, thank you very much. It's very interesting. So much more to talk about. But let's get to some of these questions now. Um, I, I will just go down them in no particular order. Um, one jumps out here. Hi, Linda. Would you comment, please, on the state of state censorship on films? that were produced at that time, so during the time of Ung Sita. So um, uh, a lot has to do, uh, I think back then, even today, you know, uh, sexualities and, uh, so there's a film uh, uh, where we see a, a short snippet of like boobs and coming, and sometimes a filmmaker trying to use sexual, sexual appeals to get at, but these are things that are very much still in uh, control and, uh, as, uh, in terms of censorships. Uh, obviously, uh, I do believe that um, people who, do, there's not much of a struggle because a lot of the film, I would say like 90% of films are folk tales. So based on stories that we heard, uh, and then doesn't really tackle anything except for Tielum Kun, who is uh, using, he's writing his own folk tale story based on folk tales characters and then making a social commentary that I think is interesting. But even that, um, because he's play around these things, he could get away. Um, censorship was quite strong back then because, uh, you know, again, filmmaker didn't dare to submit the film at the same festival than Sihanouk, mm. right? The, back then, uh, the government of Sihanouk authorized you to what can you talk about? what you can criticize. So mm -hmm. journalistic, there was limiting things in terms of how much you want to be critical. I mean, fate is real. I am quite, I am quite myself in terms of my opinions and idea about Sihanouk and I write it as is. But when it was translated in Khmer, I was, I was told that the Khmer versions the criticism I have about Sihanouk was a bit lined up. So we're not okay. talking about then, we're talking about today, 2022. Mm. So even though the king has passed away, my criticism of Sihanouk in the Khmer versions is a little bit more light. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I hope this answer, whoever question was that. <laughs> yeah. Um... Then that was from, let me look here. 
Um, I don't see it. Um, the next question is that, are the films accessible? Um, and uh, are they being restored, digitized? We can uh, digitize when we don't know where the reels are. So we don't know where the on contour sita film, we don't know where they are. We even have, the three that survive, they they uh we the, have access to them. Someone has the reel. Obviously, we don't know who. They yeah. have moved into VHS and CDs, right? Mm. And that's why. You see, they are quite uh, whoever did not restore it well, they did not digitize of it. They didn't, I, I hopefully they put in a storage room that is appropriate. I cross my finger, but we don't know to my knowledge. In other collector, I'm not sure where that those wheels are, whoever huh. has questions. So, uh, the have been, they have been converted to VHS. So somebody right. must have them. Is that the idea? That is correct. We so Bopana has, uh, so someone asked about where you could find them. You could go to Bopana. They have the, uh, you could watch the the, um, the three VHS that had been digitized. The version that I show you, the clips, is to show actually, um, you know, Nate Hoon has them. Nate Hoon has them. He gave it to uh, Hui Vatana, Hui Vatana, who gave access to uh, um, Kantuk, who now gave it to uh, Bopana, so it's a full circle. But you could watch them uh, there, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yes, um, for Um Kantuk film and Um Kantuk Sita film, we, uh, we don't know where are the reels. Well, uh, Kunz, he has them in Montreal, he's in Montreal, uh, and he has them uh, digitized, protected and everything. Li Bodiem, they had been uh, digitized properly, some of the films. Even him, some of the films, not all of them. Uh, so it depends on the filmmakers. Um, um Kantu lives in uh, a small town um, south of Bordeaux. She's not in uh, Cambodia. She's in Cam in France. Mm, I see. Uh -huh. Yes, um, you mentioned in your talk that um, taking the reels with her was the last thing on her mind as she was leaving on that last French convoy from the French embassy mm -hmm. to the, I believe the Thai border. Um, what a shame. Um, uh, so much as we hear again and again with things connected to the Khmer Rouge period was forever lost. Um, mm -hmm. And we tried to pick up the pieces um, as I think um, Amy Lee Sanford's broken pot um, installation kinds of illustrates putting back the pieces of the past meticulously little by little with what's available. Um, another question, um, you, this comes from Lawrence Chua, you referenced Ung Sita's script notations earlier in your talk. Did your research give any indication of how she worked with actors and what direction she gave them on set? That is correct. She's very um, particular particular she really wants her actor to learn the lines and it's something that actors struggle because the early Cambodian cinema was like well still today unfortunately but back then uh, they didn't have sound so you would film the actors the talking and if they didn't know the line that it didn't matter because what happened the film will show and movie theater and you have voice actor one or two who would read the script because voice actor could do like seven voice. So he could do the man, the woman, the child, whatever. And he would do that over and over again the course of the day. So director hated them because if they, you know, they could change the tone, they could change the line, they could change this. So when tape recording, um, when um, Rune came and brought back the tape recording 1968 in my memory. Uh, uh, so you could align the sound and align the visual, uh, the image together. and when um, uh, Sita started making film, sound was already aligned. So she kind of wanted her actor to know, and a lot of actors like, uh, you know, we we just say whatever, and then uh, right, then we just add the sound later. And she didn't want that. She wanted as most natural. Um, the other thing she also do, um, uh, uh, it's hard for the actor because actor has crazy schedule. They work from eight o'clock to two o'clock in the morning for different production company because they're 
not a lot of people who want to be actors. So it's always the same pool of people. So they're always going to be using the same film. So it's really challenging for actors to, remember, uh, to know all the scripts, right? So back then, what they do is like they make the films, they put the rec they take the films, they hire voice actor to record the voice. So they they have the script. Wonkan took Wonkita did not want that. She just wanted the actor to say the line, so that is proper. So uh, in that way, I think she was brilliant to hire. So she's the one who discovered Vijaradani. So she wanted to work with people who are not necessarily already trained. So she could train them. So that was interesting that she started that process, but obviously consulting did so many other uh, and not them as already famous people, but she did, Vijara was her muse, right? Why was it the, per, uh, the actress that really inspired her to, to actually make films? Perdel Bel, Tronium is a lot of overlap between real Vijara Dani character, life, the actress and the character Vijara. She took a lot of it. So I was like, where's the blurry line between Right, the character Vijarad has a, a stepmom and a half sister. Vijarad, Tit Vijaradani, the actress, also had that situation. That there's a lot of overlapping. In, interestingly, right? mm -hmm. interesting. Um, the next question um, comes from Leslie Barnes. She asks, in addition to the more intimate um, domestic scenes in the films, um, does she also record? Um, scenes of the city that document the change in the architectural um, landscape of Phnom Penh at that time? For example, the Olympic Stadium or the Chattanook Theater? No, I mean, you have to understand, um, uh, camera was really big. Uh, so a lot of time what they do, they just put on a tripod and then just follow. So like filming uh, a car drive by, you could have a, uh, the camera there and the car would drive by. Having the technology of having two cars to fall, it would be too, too um, not steady enough. And film are really expensive, that's too risky. Um, so I don't think that was part of her missions to try to document uh, anything. It was just, she was filming this. It was her house, her uncle house or whoever house they was filming using all these cars. And the city is a background, but was not intentionally, I'm going to go with this. Like I said, again, that was something specific to Sianuk. It's not something that I necessarily saw and intentions of trying to depict Phnom Penh in a way um, that is part of the intentions in that manner. Um, unless I was wrong and have to rewatch it again, but I haven't seen it. Mm. The next question asks you to uh, about could you talk about your strategies for working with faded and fragmented materials? Do you have a method, quote unquote, that might be helpful for others? So I think the one thing to think, even the sound, uh, the uh, um, sound, so you have the visual, you have sound. I think the one thing is to, to watch without the sound. Why? Because a lot of the surviving today's film or added sound. Someone in Long Beach and all these companies were doing add sounds because they want to make it more modern, right? For example, there's a film like, um, I think uh, um, Chet Madai, which is gonna show in, uh, in, um, in Bupana, you have two versions of the sound, one with the soundtrack of Love Story, the American film, Love Story, and another one with Careless Whisper by George Michael. You obviously know that it's not the original sound, right? So sound is, uh, and sound is so bad, sometimes it's, um, when you're making films, spending money and sound design is crucial because sound has a psychological impact on you, much more than visuals. Sounds create your sense of fear. Music has power of you. So if you watch this film and watch sounds that are crunchy and blurry and all these things you can't hear them it's best to mute them and just read like you even just read the whatever subtitle and just look try to understand the story and then after that you could add sound I feel like if you watch that way it would ha help you see beyond the psychology you have and see the visual it is um, you will have to be willing to watch different versions. If you, you're working in films and before the Khmer Rouge, there are different versions, right? Père d'Atranium has many versions because someone found reels that are not in one piece. They piece it together. 
but it's not necessarily the order that she fits them. So sometimes it's like, that makes no sense. Why is this scene here? And because someone recreated, recut the stories. So even the storytelling is being recut, recharged. Uh, so that's why it's so it's important to go and find as many versions possible to see which one is the most original or closest to the original ones. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, uh, filmmaking. Uh, it's now it's a performative art, but people feel it's collaborative. But um, the best one is Telem Kun, who has his whole film, he has all his film, his versions, all the sounds and everything is in his positions, right? Mm, amazing. Um, the last question that we have is another question about censorship, but instead of during the Sihanouk era, um, currently, um, do you think that uh, there is government censorship that restricts filmmakers from what they can do? Well, yes. You know, you guys have been uh, in Phnom Penh. I'm sure you've heard about Matt Dillon coming with Serial Ghost. Well, when uh, Matt Dillon, one of the things, uh, uh, Matt Dillon, when they submitted the script to the Cambodian cinema, they didn't give the real title, which is Serial Ghost. And the reason, because the title of Serial Ghost was so negative, and back then, Cambodian government wanted to depict something so positive, that they would say no. So they changed the title, right? So the Cambodian government really does read the script and really goes in. So it does limit um, how much you can be creative. I'm not talking about you stating political disagreement with whatever happening. It's even just the way you want to depict, there is some kind of like, you have to depict Cambodia in a certain way or else your film will be banned. And see the ghost was banned for a while. Now it's, uh, you know, because he was showing Cambodia not its best. Um, but I don't think, I watched City Girls, I don't think Matt Dillon was looking to depict Cambodia as its worst. He was just depicting Cambodia as it, it was. Um, but yes, today there is a lot of, um, you know, uh, you talk to Kavigny, you can talk to all the other, there are things that they navigate, they try to, and they have to go and justify the decision why certain things are happening. Uh, there is still controls and censorships, yes. It makes sense. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you again, Linda, for taking your time. I know it's late on the East Coast of the United States right now. Um, and uh, we really enjoyed your talk and your presentation and your insights and all the work you've done over the years. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. You said you're coming back to Cambodia on the Fulbright um, in a couple yes. of I'm here. going to be working on uh, the next step of Cambodian cinema, uh, watching. Uh, so, so you know, some people think, and Annette Hamilton wrote this, that first Cambodian film made after the Khmer Rouge was um, uh, uh, Shadow uh, um, Over Anchor by Yvon Ham, but it's not. The first film was made, it was in 1980. It's My, my Mother is Arb. Um, uh, so I will be watching and documenting and uh, interviewing filmmaker from the 80s and the 90s. Hmm. And when will you be doing that? Is that next year or this year? January 2024 um, uh, onward. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, we'll look forward to that. Um, again, thanks very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing you again here at CKS soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. All good.